We're now in Mechanicsville, Virginia, in my shop. I'm Ray Dio, and I joined Richmond Woodturners in 2004. If you were to stand up tall and look down in this shop, you'd find that uh, we're in a two-car garage that's split in half. The far half of the garage is where I do all of the maintenance and projects, and it supports the house and the yard. If I have to assemble something, I do it there. And it's also used for, for uh, periodic wood storage. When I did flat work in this shop, I would set my tools up on that side and make my project. But I'm fortunate in that I've got two older sons. They both live in the area. One of them happens to live at the other end of the same development we're in. They're both woodworkers. They both have full shops, and they both work during the day. So if I want to do a flat work project, I don't have to do it here. And somehow, a couple of my tools have kind of migrated to their shops over the years. I do maintain a, a small job site uh, saw stop table saw that I can set up quickly to do small projects and I have all of the hand tools that I used when this was a full shop. Uh, but for the most part, I don't do flat work here. This half of the garage is what I actually call my shop. And it has always and currently, everything in this half of the shop supports this right here. This is a complete wood turning shop. In 1996, I had been thinking about uh, what I was doing in high school because I had done some turning in high school and decided I want to try it. So I went out and bought a lathe and a, an inexpensive set of eight turning tools, which was my first mistake, and uh, picked up an eight foot two by two, cut it into 12 foot lengths, and over a few weeks proceeded to turn the sticks of wood into chips on the floor. I didn't know what I was doing, uh, used the tools wrong, but I was hooked. I fell in love with, with wood turning. So I joined the local wood turning club. And a member of that club was Ernie Conover. And Ernie uh, lived 30 minutes from my house. He also taught uh, bowl classes on the weekends. So I took his bowl class. And I've been learning ever since. My first lathe was a Delta full size. <clears throat> it had a 12 inch swing, 36 inch bed on steel legs, one and a half horsepower motor. I used it for several years. I eventually wore it out and ended up throwing it away and replacing it with a Nova 3000. The Nova 3000 let me increase my swing from 12 inches to 14 inches. I still had 36 inch length. It increased the motor from one and a half to two, which got me into uh, uh, two horsepower, which got me into 220 power. And the motor, the headstock would tilt so I could do something larger. And I used that lathe for about 10 years. Uh, eventually, I outgrew the lathe. It became very frustrating because it wouldn't let me do what I wanted to do, so I decided to buy one more lathe. The criteria for this next lathe was that it had to support any growth that I had in the future. It had to be big enough, strong enough, powerful enough to let me learn what I didn't know at the time. So I researched a variety of of power tool companies. I test drove several different lathes and I ended up settling with the, the one way. I picked the one way for a couple of reasons. First of all, one way is not a power tool company. They are a lathe company. They only make lathes and lathe accessories. Their focus, their expertise was where my focus was. So it was really a good match. When I talked to them, they said it would take six to eight weeks to ship the lathe once it was ordered because they made them as they were ordered. So there's a lot of handmade in this lathe. I like the fit and the finish. I like the precision. I like the fact that there's more brass in it than, than anything. I like the fact that I can, I can move the tailstock and all I've got to do is flip this up and that tailstock is not going to move. That's how precise the lathe is. It also let me go from uh, a 14 inch swing to 24, or yeah, 24 inch swing. And when I added a small bed extension, I can put a five foot long piece of wood on between centers. So it will accommodate any piece of wood that I want to put on it. I like the fact that it had variable speed within three belt ranges. It has forward and reverse. But I particularly liked this button right here. This is an emergency stop. If I hit this button, It'll electron, put an electronic brake in and stop the, rot stop the lathe in three to four rotations. And admittedly, twice I've had to hit this due to operator error. Both of them were large pieces, and I was glad I had this button. To make the lathe 
everything I wanted it to be, I had to add some features when I ordered the lathe. So I increased the motor size from two horsepower to three horsepower. I added the light package. I put the twin lights on instead of the single light. It gave me the, uh, the, power, the power outlets right in front of me. And I increased the indexing system from 48 points to 96 points. So now I had a lathe that could accommodate anything I wanted. And I liked the fact that as it sits here, it sits at about 700 pounds. It's not going to move. And the legs are adjustable. So if I ever decided to sell it, somebody taller or shorter than me can ergonomically set this lathe to the proper height. Matter of fact, when I ordered it, they asked me my height because they, they set the lathe height ergonomically appropriate for my use. When I set the lathe up, I had had lathes against walls in the, back, in the past and decided that I wanted to have it in the open because I wanted 360 access to the lathe. It's easier to clean. It's easier to access the piece that I'm turning. So I put it in the middle of the garage. Uh, but I wanted everything in a straight line. I wanted everything accessible to me. I didn't want to have to reach and go looking for and bend over. I wanted everything handy to me on the, on the lathe. So when I set it up, I used some, uh, some magnets. Before I get into that, I should also point out that another feature of the lathe that I liked is that I don't have to have a remote on-off switch at the end if I'm down at the end. The on-off switch and all the controls will go down there and will face in that direction. It all, I can position it anywhere I want. I can mount it on the back of the lathe. So if I'm turning left-handed, it's right in front of me. And if I'm turning right-handed, it's still in front of me. And I've got access to the, the emergency stop. So I liked that. But in setting everything up in a line, I wanted everything accessible. So I used magnets, uh, rare earth magnets. So these are the two wrenches that I typically use. I have a six inch ruler. This is a ruler that I use all the time. I use it so much that I even have one on the other side of the shop so I don't have to carry it with me. Uh, I put a magnetic tray on the top so it carries the, uh, the piece of wax so I can wax my tool rest. It's got small pencils and it's got all the pieces and parts and cutters to my small hollowing system which, which is the Jameson system. I also on the end I put a uh, vacuum chuck. The vacuum chuck is always plugged in. It's ready to go. All I have to do is take off the hand wheel, which happens to be the six inch face plate for one way, and attach the vacuum chuck. I can do it in a couple of minutes, and I'm ready to go. I, I don't use the vacuum chuck any more than maybe two or three times a year, but it's handy to have. And the motor is down below. Uh, the motor is mounted on a piece of four by, four by six piece of wood, and I have a dust cover over it that I slide off when I'm, when I'm going to use it so it doesn't get covered with chips. I want my tools handy. Obviously, it can't be in front of me because there's no wall in front of me. So I took a, uh, a, 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 a basically a, a, a tool bench and put wheels on it, covered three sides in the top with three quarter inch plywood, used two inch PVC pipe, put a small strip of wood underneath so the tools wouldn't, wouldn't fall through when I put them in there. But it also left some gaps in the bottom of it. So as chips happen to migrate into the tube, They'll dry over time, and as I take the tools in and out, they'll break up and fall through, so it's all self-cleaning. It also gave me a place to put my chucks. I do occasionally use the Fordham. I'm currently working on a project that uh, I'm using it quite a bit. So all I did was take a two by two and substituted one of the tool holders by sticking this in there. I mounted, it, uh, mounted the Fordham on the two by two and I'm ready to go. I've always got my, my, uh, my, my head handy to me and the foot pedal is right here, always plugged in, whoops, always plugged in. So all I have to do is plug it into the unit itself and I'm ready to go. Uh, I do have an extra, extra magnetic dish if I need it. So everything is handy down at this end. I've also used magnets for a few other things. Uh, if I am put doing something large and I need a large drive center, uh, magnetically attached is the large drive center that happens to go into, into the chuck. If I want a smaller drive center, it's mounted on, again, a magnet on the tool rest, and I can put the, put the small drive center in. Calipers. Calipers are attached to the lathe with a magnet. If uh, I did find, though, that there were times that uh, I would pull something off the lathe and the magnet would come with it and when I went to use it, all of a sudden it would attach itself to the tool rest. So to avoid that, what I did is I took a, a small piece of duct tape and put it over the magnet 
and the duct tape holds the magnet to the lathe. It's as if the lathe is magnetic itself. So everything is here at my fingertips. This is the chuck to the, the this is the key to the chuck. I like to keep it underneath, uh, in front of the headstock, underneath the chuck. It's always handy. I did find though that in the beginning, as I would put it on the tool rest uh, or on the on the bed, it would start marking the bed. So I took a small piece of leather and clamped and clamped a piece of leather to it, and it stopped it, it stopped uh, uh, making marks on the on the on the beds. It's been there for ten years, and uh, it still works great. On this end of the lathe, uh, I have a small tray. It's magnetically attached, so I can position it anywhere, any position. Uh, and if I'm working on something that I'm using lots of pieces, let's say I've got uh, various size drill bits, a couple of carving tools, maybe a few files, uh, a few pieces of sandpaper, a couple calipers, they're all going to be sitting right here and there's a small lip around it so they don't roll off. I've also drilled holes in uh, the top of this cabinet. Um, this, this holds the drive center, the step center. The, the live center and the drill chuck, and you'll notice that I have two drill chucks. The reason why is that this particular lathe has a three Morris taper tailstock, a two Morris taper headstock. Um, I'm not sure why. I suspect it's because you can put something large enough on here where it needs the strength of, uh, of, a, of a bigger Morris taper and a, and a sturdier tailstock, but I'm not sure. And then the grinder is also right in line, so I just have to move over to use my, my grinder. It's an, it's an eight inch slow speed grinder. I use the Wolverine system. I have the Vera grind jig to keep it handy. Uh, I do not have CBN wheels. I personally, I don't see the need for CBN. Um, this Norton stone I put on 10 years ago, it was eight inches. I measured it the other day, it's now seven. So I've lost an inch in 10 years. So I don't think I'm gonna need to replace that that wheel, but if I ever do, uh, I'll certainly do a cost benefit analysis of the CBNs before I buy a replacement. Notice that I've got um, uh, silicone mats on both the tray and the top of this. These are just a large mat that I bought from Woodcraft, cut it to size, stapled them in place. These, these mats, nothing sticks to them. They're easy to clean. Nothing damages them. So I, I like the mats. I even have a piece that I put over the bed underneath my turning when I'm doing any gluing or, uh, or, or finishing. And then behind here, I have a small uh, portable engine hoist. That engine hoist is on wheels. I can roll it around here, and I can put a piece of wood on the lathe that I otherwise couldn't pick up. So it's, uh, I'm able to put a 150 pound piece of, piece of wood on this thing and turn a large hollow form if I want to just because of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the engine hoist. I should probably point out a couple more things for those of you who are looking for a particular tip. Uh, I keep my compressor right down here. Again, I want everything in line. And I have the hose uh, handy to me, this, this long extension. And I also have one that's 12 inches for cleaning out hollow forms. Uh, you can get these at Harbor Freight for about, uh, about $5. Um, I, uh, I, I could use the coil hose, but uh, I have it clipped right here, coiled up, uh, so I can take this out to, the, uh, uh, out to the cars if I ever need to blow up a tire. You know how tires are in the fall. For some reason, we have to add air to some of the tires. Uh, when we travel, my, my wife always asks, is everything unplugged in the garage? And uh, what, I, what I have done is I've taken uh, all of my 110 power and I've put it into a couple of outlets here and put it on a switch. So the grinder, the compressor, the light package, and the, uh, uh, the vacuum chuck are all plugged in right here. So all I got to do is turn the power off, and we're ready to go. I don't bother unplugging the lathe unless there's a heavy storm coming through because I, uh, I don't unplug my dryer. So why should I unplug the lathe? Over here is a, is a workbench that uh, used to be the primary workbench when I did flat work in the shop. Right now it's primarily used for storage, although I do use the two, the two vices that are on it. 
Uh, any of my extra turning tools are in here. Generally, they're the tools that I don't use very often. So the chatter tool, knurling tool, miniature tools for Christmas ornaments. You don't, you don't use them often, so I keep them in here. And uh, these, these two cabinets I picked up from a good friend of mine who's since passed away. Uh, they are not totally uh, lathe oriented. There's lots of small things in here, but they're very handy. You may find that I like drawers. I don't like shelves. I don't like cabinets. I used to have cabinets in the shop. Uh, I, I, I just didn't like them, so, so I went to all drawers. It keeps the, the shop a little more tidy. It's easier to clean the shop. So I just put everything in drawers. So this kind of supports that. Uh, over here, I, uh, I have a couple of steady rests. Uh, I do use two of them on some larger pieces. Uh, and then this area here, everybody has to have music in their shop. So I've got, uh, I've got music when, when I'm out here. The, the speakers are in the back. Uh, there are a couple of shelves up there. While I don't like shelves, I need a place to put some things that don't go in drawers. That sh those shelves are kind of a mixed match of everything. There's a, there's a couple of shapes up there that are there to remind me to never make the shape again. Uh, there's a couple of shapes that I particularly like that I will use from time to time. If I do any prototypes or if I make a one-off item, I might keep it just to make sure I know how to do it if I ever have to do it again. But if anything ever happened and, and, this, uh, and this shop was, was, was closed up, all you'd have to do is just slide that stuff into a garbage can and take the shelves down and you'd be done. I should point out these here. Uh, these are sanding dust from a variety of, of species of wood. Uh, I don't care for uh, putting uh, non-wood materials into cracks and crevices and voids and, and, and def defects. I like to fill them with wood. I like to make them look like they belong there. Um, you can't really hide them unless you're particularly good at it. Maybe some of the small ones you can make go invisible, but I just want to make sure that they belong there. So with these colors, I can, I can, uh, I can mix colors. I can, I can match grain, uh, types of wood. Uh, and with, when one runs low, if I'm sanding a similar piece of wood, I always come over here to see if I need to capture any of the sanding dust. So this is just for filling voids and cracks. You'll notice, here's my drawer cabinet. When I built these drawers, uh, cabinets, I built the four three drawer cabinets, but I went down and measured the length of, uh, uh, of the laminated tops at Woodcraft. So I paired them with connecting bolts and I mounted the, the, uh, the laminated tops. So I've got a great workbench here for, do, for doing anything that I want to. I can take things off the lathe and bring them over here if I, if I, if I need to. Um, I also put a light over this area so I can, I've got, I've got plenty of light if, if I need to work on something. Uh, these drawers are just sandpaper and uh, I like to use quarter sheets of sandpaper so, so they're in here. Um, and these things, a few things hanging on the wall, they've kind of always been on the wall. They're things that I use on a fairly regular basis. Wood storage. Um, I don't keep a lot of green wood in the shop. Uh, I believe my philosophy is that there's, there's more wood that I can turn in a lifetime. So I won't turn cracked wood. If I bring a piece of wood in here and it cracks and I can't do something with it relatively quickly, uh, I, I get rid of that piece of wood. But I do make a lot of pieces that are multiple species or multiple parts. And I'm always looking to match grain or color or finishing characteristics. Uh, for example, if, you, if to finish a piece of mahogany might take four coats, to finish a piece of maple takes two coats. If you put them together, either one is overfinished or one is underfinished. Uh, if you look at these three pieces of wood right here, those are three pieces of mahogany, or three pieces of walnut. Three different trees, three different areas, all the same. I, if I want to put another piece of walnut on something, I'm going for a color. So I label my pieces of wood. And I know its hardness, I know its, character, its, its, its grain pattern and in the, in the wood characteristics, the finishing characteristics, and the color. So if I want to match or, 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 or put different colors together, I can do that. So I like to, I like to, to, uh, to, to label my wood. The flat wood, uh, the sticks of wood, I keep on both sides uh, to the left here and higher up on the right. Uh, basically, these are cutoffs from those. Uh, also, if I, 
if I have a piece of uh, green wood that I, I particularly want to keep, but it's beginning to crack, I might cut it into smaller pieces, label it, and put it up here after I dry it. So, so this, is, this is my wood storage. Uh, for green wood, uh, I, I used to keep all sorts of green wood. I used to have stacks of it in the back, cover it with tarps, keep some of it in a shed, and I finally realized that wood tends to go bad. So what I do is uh, I had the luxury of living in a development that has almost a thousand homes. And when they built the development, they didn't allow the trees to be cut when the houses were built, unless they absolutely have to. So people are always taking down trees and planting new trees. So in the fall, I listen for a chainsaw. I'm on the hunt right now. I go to where the chainsaw is, talk to the tree surgeons, and I ask for a three or four foot piece of wood. And Typically, they will take their skid steer and put it in the back of my truck, and I'm, and I'm done. I look for three or four of those in the fall, and that's my winter wood, and I want it gone by mid-April to, to the, the latest early May. And then in the summer, I just start picking up pieces of wood as I want, just listening for the chainsaw. I keep them on the other side of the garage, wax the ends, keep them in whole, cut off sections as I want to, so I just don't store a lot of green wood. Uh, the rest of the power tools that support the lathe are here. They're all plugged in. All I have to do is pull them out. Normally my smock is on me. It's not hanging on the dust collector. Um, I'll talk about dust management real quick in just a minute. They're all plugged in. All I have to do is pull them out, turn them on, ready to go, and, uh, and put them back. My Jameson system is on a hook on the wall here, uh, so it's out of the way. Uh, even though the drill press is on wheels, uh, I, I generally leave it right here and, and use, the, use the drill press. Dust collection. I don't have a lot of dust collection. I do have air cleaner. There's, a, there's an air cleaner in the ceiling right, in, right, right, above, right above the center part of the garage. Um, this small dust collector, though, comes in very handy. When we did Catherine Harris's shop, she introduced me to the magnetic uh, ends to the uh, to the dust to the dust hoses, so I don't I took all the plastic pieces off and put these ends on. So for example, all I need to do is pull my bandsaw out. I, I took the uh, I, I took the four inch connector off and connect it to the, my 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 bandsaw. Turn on the turn on the system and it keeps it dust free. For cleaning the shop, I have a two and a half inch hose. It's getting kind of beat up, but I also put a, a, a magnetic end on that. So I can join these two together and plug this into the vacuum attachment and I can keep my, uh, keep my shop clean. Then I use it for one more thing. And this is probably the best thing I've done for the lathe. And this is a tip that I, I truly want to share with everyone. I had the four inch hose connector on a cone that was on a stand that I got at Woodcraft. Uh, it became very frustrating because it was always in the way, it wasn't in the wheels, I had to stop and relocate it, uh, tough to clean around. So what I did is I took the cone off of the stand, threw the stand away, and went down to metal supermarkets and bought quarter inch thick, two inch wide pieces of steel and had them cut it to different lengths. Then I took a piece of high, high density plastic and I put it on the lathe and I turned grommets and used bolts and pressure washers or pressure nuts and put it together and mounted to the lathe and put an articulating arm on the back of my lathe. So now I can bring that cone out and I can, it'll go down to the end of the lathe if I want to. And when I'm, when I'm sanding right here, it will, it will take all the sanding dust away from me. And when I want it out of my way, I can just pu push, it, push it out of the way. It's not on the floor, it's attached to the lathe, it reaches anywhere, I can adjust the height. It, uh, it's about the handiest thing that I've got uh, um, to, to keep, the, keep the, the, the area clean and to keep me healthy. To connect it, I have a piece of four inch pipe, again with the magnetic connector. All I've got to do is connect the two of them on, on, uh, with, with, magnetic, with the magnetic attachments, bring this over, turn the dust collector on, and I'm ready to go. And then when I'm done, all I have to do is move it out of my way. I can disconnect these, and I just because the because the lathe is metal, it, it attaches to the lathe, and I'm I'm all cleaned up. So I can keep the shop relatively clean while I'm doing it. So that's it. 
that's my shop. Uh, it's not very big, it's 12 by 20, uh, but it, uh, everything here supports this lathe and it lets me do anything I want to do. Before we end, Stan, I've got to bring you back out behind the stand, still behind the camera, and we need to bring him out in front of, front of, the, front of the audience again. As I said in one of the other uh, tours, this is the guy that makes things happen. He is the videographer, he is the director, and he's the editor. Uh, we could not have had this, and I could not have done this without you. This has been an absolute pleasure. We have been invited into 15 shops from members of Richmond Wood Turners. Uh, we have gained tips and tricks, maybe some solutions to problems. Um, it's, uh, some of the shops have been in garages, some of them in sheds, some, or some of them in, in standalone buildings, some of them in basements. And if after watching these, your shop is just a little bit better than it was when we started, then we were successful. So bye for now, and I say for now because you never know. We might be impromptu. Sometime pick up our camera, knock on your door, and ask if we can take a look at your shop. But until then, goodbye. Goodbye.